welcome to my workshop in this video i'm gonna be showing you how i make my transparent enamel color palettes i like complete color palettes since they show me basically everything this color can do so i uh, i apply it over silver foil gold foil uh, flux uh, opal opalescent enamel uh, white opaque enamel and also direct in the copper uh, so yeah Let's get started, I will show you how I make that. These are the coppers I use for uh, enameling my color palettes. They are pre-made, they are shaped. I almost always use shaped coppers. Mm, I don't like flat uh, shapes, uh, only when the design requires it I use them. So I purchased these uh, pre-shaped. It's really worth it for me, it's like a 30 euro cent per, per copper and I don't have to bother uh, bending the copper myself and so on so I'm gonna show you the in which order I apply these layers uh, the total operations is six so let's get to it okay the first thing I do is I mark my copper with a steel point just to make it easier for me in successive layers uh, after that I counter enamel and I fire and I pickle which will make it much easier for me. I don't have to bother uh, with the back and the front and drying and uh, so on, contamination from the back to the front. And since I make uh, at least six at a time, this really works for me. Uh, next, what I do after counter enameling is the most complex layers that these palettes have. What I do is uh, I apply a strip of my color directly on the copper. Uh, I, I really like to know how it behaves on top of the copper. After this I apply a layer of opaque white and then opalescent white. And finally flux for the rest. Next operation is fixing my uh, foils. I put a thin strip of uh, gold foil and a bit thinner, thicker strip of silver foil and I fix them. For the next operation it is uh, over half of the silver foil I apply silver flux since I want to know how this color behaves over flux and direct on the uh, silver some colors really react on the silver and I want to know what my possibilities are. I fire this, clean the edges like usual and then our next is very easy, is just color all over. So all over. One thin layer, fire and clean. And last, we have uh, over half the palette but up to the gold a layer of the same color so here we have two layers okay so the end result are these palettes in which we have um, the color directly on copper here there will be two layers and here three uh, in this case it's good because it has to take the oxide out from the copper so a bit of a thicker layer helps uh, here we have one layer and two layers over opaque white here one layer and two layer over opalescent white not a very uh, opaque one this is t8 from blight and i like it to not be too close to an opaque white i have a different uh, effect here as you see in some colors more than others but it's quite quite different and here i have uh, one and two layers over flux copper flux and here uh, one and two layers over gold foil. In here, since uh, we will make it too complex otherwise, I only have one layer, but in this case it's uh, there is flux here in between the foil and the color, and here is direct on the silver. And as you can see, um, these are pretty complete and I have a lot of different effects that I can achieve with the same color. I normally like to make a list of which colors I need to wash, and then make a selection of colors that are not too similar so that when I'm firing them I'm not confusing them especially on the first fire uh, we only have the reference of the color direct on copper and sometimes they are really dark or really similar and then we don't know which one is which so here I'm making a list of all, all the colors I want to wash I need to wash 
and then I select, uh, in this case I select a uh, blue, a green, yellow, uh, a red and actually two greys because I have a lot of greys to wash but one is much colder than the other which is a warm grey. So uh, this way I can make sure I'm not gonna be mixing them up especially after the first fire. I also like to write the, the numbers of the colors on a sticker and I will put this on the glasses where I wash them so that I don't confuse them while I'm washing them. I use these tall glasses for cleaning the enamels in and uh, right before I'm gonna wash the enamels I wash them with detergent. The surfactant in it will make sure that there are no particles left from other times sticking to the walls of the glass and then uh, contaminating your color. So I wash them very well with this long brush and I rinse them very well and I make sure there are no stickers left from another time. a spoon to transfer enamel from my uh, container into my glass and as always remember that when you are dealing with dry enamel you must wear a dust mask to protect you from it. I have to make sure to clean the spoon very well before I switch colors to not contaminate it and uh, in this case I'm washing about one teaspoon because that's just enough for the palette. Uh, and if I want to wash more, I make sure to not put too much into the glass or it's very difficult to get the color perfectly washed. So I would say a maximum of 50 grams. Uh, and then I make sure to label my glasses either with a sticker or with a marker. I really prefer to use tall glasses for washing. As you see here, for a small amount, the power from the tap is enough to move up all these particles of enamel into the water and this way you wash the whole amount perfectly well. When you have a larger amount of enamel you have to manually swish it but the height of the glass also allows me to do this without worrying that I'm gonna spill anything. And all the particles come up from the bottom and then I can fill it up and on to the next. As you see here it's also very easy to decant the water from the glass and uh, the enamel remains at the bottom and I have no fear of spilling any of it. Give it a try and you will see how the height of the glass really makes a big difference. I like to use this cut up jug and I pour uh, the water from my glasses into it and then the fines that otherwise I will be throwing down the drain, they can settle to the bottom and then I can pour the water out. I repeat this process with tap water until the water is clear after waiting a moment. Uh, how long you wait depends on the amount of uh, enamel that is in the glass, uh, how fine the enamel is or how many fines uh, there are in the enamel, so it may vary uh, with the brands. Here you can see too that uh, at the beginning of the process are still very cloudy and after a few washes you would see how these uh, fine particles that are were before floating in the water, they have been poured out and then they become clear like this. This is ready for washing with the distilled water. And this one here is a uh, flux. I have a big amount here and it takes longer. So it's still cloudy. Once I'm ready uh, to go on to the next step, which is distilled water, I pour all the tap water out. And uh, I have this container up here with distilled water. It has a tap, so I can just pour a small amount, maybe a third of the glass. And uh, I can swish it well so that all the particles get suspended in the water. And then on to the next. Uh, I do this uh, three or four times, depending on the amount that is in the glass. And then I can pour out most of the water, but not all, because I need a little bit of water to swish it into my containers, as you see here. I will just swish and pour and then pour the excess water back in the glass and repeat until I get all the enamel into the container.
use to enamel the backs of these coppers is a spatula. I don't have to mess with the uh, sifter, the mess it makes, the uh, mask for the dust, and it's very fast, so I really like to use it. Uh, since I'm gonna enamel, counter enamel and not put anything on the front on the first fire, I don't have to bother with the glue either. So I have here some dry counter enamel that's not being washed. I'm simply gonna add uh, distilled water to it, just a little bit. Not too much, I don't need it to be too liquid. Uh, I like to add distilled water because I let it remain there and tap water may have a negative effect on the enamel that it starts uh, boiling or so on from all the mineral deposits. So I just only add distilled water to my counter enamel uh, bowl. Okay, so basically I just pick up a little bit and spread it out. Uh, it doesn't have to be very perfect, so the spatula is good enough. We will add uh, a decent layer, so I don't have to bother with the counter enamel anymore, just this layer. Since the coppers are shaped, I don't have to worry too much about uh, evening out the tension front to back. So just a decent layer will be enough. As you can see, I have not cleaned or pickled these coppers at all. Uh, I don't get much uh, problems with the enamel trying to beat up since I'm using a spatula and pretty dry enamel. I can simply push it around and it stays there. So I don't worry about grease. It will disappear in the fire. And uh, for oxides, I also don't bother because this is just a counter enamel and it can deal with the oxide that will form there anyway in the fire. I'm gonna be blotting this with blotting paper. I can simply press it on and very little remains on the paper. And these papers can be let to dry and reused many times, so I really like to use them. I can really just push it in and it's dry enough to bring to my firing area. Okay, that's good. Let's plot these two. And we're ready for the fire. Okay, I have my uh, palettes here. This will be off the frame. Uh, there is still some humidity in my palettes from enameling earlier and I'm not gonna bother waiting until they're dry since with the heat of the fiber they, this water will evaporate. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it. I will be firing all these pieces at the same time since I, I really don't mind if some are more over fire than others, it's just counter enamel. Okay, so here is my surface. I don't know if you can see that it's really hot. Uh, I really don't want to touch it. So I will be using a spatula to put them here on the surface. As I put them here, I can see some humidity evaporating. That's really, since I blotted them, it's really enough. My enamel is not gonna be boiling inside the kiln. Can wait a few seconds until this one is as dry as that one. I see that these three are still a bit wet and it's taking too long. So what I'm gonna be doing is just show it the warmth of the kiln. just in and out and here up to the light I can see that they are drying up so I'm now gonna just stick them in ready so 
Here the screws on the back are obviously more fire than the others, but this is good enough. They will be receiving a few more fires. And what I'm going to be doing now is uh, putting this pieces in a this is a Danish cookie tin because these uh, pieces on the other side they don't have enamel so the oxide is going to be jumping all over the place and I don't want it to be contaminating my work area so I put them in here it's also good because this tin is uh, very flexible so they don't get a shock when they get in here it's also very thin so it gets hot and there is no thermal shock so I even have a lid and I can put it on and wait all right uh, I will now put the fiber back in the kiln because I want it to be warm so these coppers are now all these oxides is loose so I'm gonna be rinsing them under the tap can you see that I will be rinsing that under the tap and then pickling them uh, I will always be grabbing them by the edge because I don't want to leave any fingerprints any grease marks into them and then we will we can enamel the first layer okay so I'm gonna be applying first flux if you remember it was direct opaque white and opalescent white so I'm gonna be applying flux to the first three sections and that's gonna be so here one uh, copper flux, which I have here. I'm gonna be getting rid of excess water in a little ball I have here off the frame. I want my boxes to be inclined so that I have a drier enamel up here and more wet down here so I can choose which degree of humidity I need at a certain moment. I also have a, a linen, uh, really fine linen cloth, it has no lint in it. Uh, my brush is, um, let's see, Da Vinci Maestro, Series 10 I believe. I also have here some strips of uh, blotting paper. I cut them with straight edges and I can actually use them to cheat a little bit to make the lines. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, yeah, this is distilled water. So I'm wet, wet packing, I always have to be careful to not contaminate my first layer with the counter enamel, but since I already fired it, I really don't have to worry about it. When we do copper flux layer, we have to be actually quite generous because the first layer has to be uh, thick enough to resist a strong fire, the strong fire necessary to uh, absorb all the copper oxide. When we heat up the copper, it generates copper oxide on the first layer, the first fire, and all this copper oxide has to be basically um, dissolved into the flux. Flux is formulated to be able to absorb all of these oxides. The majority of uh, enamels are not able and that's why they look quite dull or dark. So it cannot be too thin on the first layer and we have to also make sure there is enough especially on the edges since enamel when it uh, uh, when you fire it it kind of liquefies and it wants to like water it wants to form a ball so it wants to contract towards the center so if you don't have enough enamel on the edges you will get bare edges these are just palettes but it's always good to do things right the first time around and get a good habit. Okay, so we need to come up to here, first line. I'm working quite wet since these pieces are practically flat and that helps me even out my layer. This layer must be basically almost two millimeter thick. Maybe one and a half. This enamel has not been ground, it's straight from the manufacturer, washed obviously. But I have not ground it. Okay, so that's it for my flux. Um, my line is uh, pretty decent, but I can always cheat a little bit by pushing a bit with my blotting paper. 
will also dry it a little bit. If it's very wet and we bring on another color, the water in this segment may suck up and make a mess on the edge. So it's good to not have it too, too wet, but also not too dry. You will never want your enamel to dry when you are wet packing and re-wet it because then you will get very weird uh, like sweat marks actually okay the next color here is our opalescent I'm using Blight TH uh, TH sorry make sure there's no enamel in my brush and we will apply a thin strip of this one. And now, let's uh, clean this up a bit. Now we need to apply the opaque white. This is my opaque white. I'm using Soye 148. Unfortunately, they don't make this one anymore. But they have 160, which is similar. I think it's a little bit... Uh, softer but don't quote me on that okay and down here I'm gonna apply my color um, as mentioned I took colors that were all very different from each other so it's easier to avoid confusion especially after the first fire and onto the second then you are like, oh my, which one is which? So I have really a variety of colors here. Let's start with this yellow. That's the critical moment. It was quite wet, but I can just push it in there. You can also work a bit uh, in cereal and do all your flux, all your uh, opalescent white and color direct. And that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, maybe I will do some um, speed video up or do a stop motion kind of thing. I have to be careful if I do this to keep an eye on all the palettes as I'm doing it to not let any color dry out. Sometimes I prefer to make like a rope and then slowly push it so the joint wants to run horizontally and not 
straight into my second color. And the last is red. Yes. You can't tell, but it's red. So here we have first layer, it's still wet, most of them are still wet, some are drier. I'm gonna be firing three and then three. I will not fire these two grays together because when they come out they may be undistinguishable from each other, hopefully not. So let's, uh, can you see that? Yes. This is hot. So let's take the red and this grayish. And the blue maybe. Let's 
and as I put them there this one is already dry quite dry these two not so so I'm gonna be warming them up at the kiln door I'm impatient like that I also like to not dry on top of the kiln or so because then you move them on and you may just spill it all when it's too dry so this way I make sure I already have them in place by the time I put them in looks pretty dry yeah that's dry enough this should all behave quite similarly I want the flux to be on the, the bottom of the kiln, the in, deeper in the kiln is always warmer than the door so I'm putting the flux at the back even though maybe these colors also need a strong fire but supposedly all of these colors should behave more or less the same way all of those we don't know so maybe more tender than others Let's see how they behave The camera died while I was firing the first three palettes, so moving on to the next three. So now that the first layer is fired, it's time for foil. Uh, I have them pre-marked from um, the previous time I made palettes, so uh, I just have to cut them and then apply them. The foil comes in between uh, two sheets of tissue paper, so that's easier to handle and to cut. I am using clear fire. Uh, normally I use Trachecast gum, but uh, I wanted to try it and it behaves exactly the same way for foil. So I just uh, brush a little amount on and then I can pick up the foil with the brush itself and lay it on, place it correctly and on to the next. reordering the palettes to separate the grays and cleaning my brush and now they are ready to fix the foil on now that these are fired it's time for silver flux I have to apply it to half of the silver foil. As you see here, reds in particular, they react to silver. So if there is flux, you see the pink clearly. And if there isn't, you get a reaction. So it turns uh, orange or brownish or even sometimes opaque. Now I 
have to fire these six pellets and as usual I have to clean the edge to make sure I don't have any oxide jumping into my uh, enamel and then we will come back. The flux is fired now. As you can see sometimes it wrinkles up a little bit together with the flux but this is not a problem it will smoothen in the next uh, layers and you don't need to have a perfect surface every time you are going to put on another layer in that case you could overfire other parts so you can just leave it like this so now it's finally time to apply the first color layer it goes all over the palette. Now that this layer is fired and the edges are cleaned, uh, it's time for the last layer. This one is only applied to half of the palette and I will not be applying it on the silver since I, we already have uh, one half with silver flux and one without. So it's up to the gold. One more fire and they are finished. I'm going to show you how I make the opaque enamel color palettes. The process is the same but much simpler and they are smaller so it's quite self-explanatory.
So now it's time to label uh, the palettes. When I have time, I use uh, China on glaze paint and I will just write it on fire and this way it will never come off, but it takes a while. So I only do it when I have the time for it. So now I'm just going to put a sticker on. This blue from Milton Bridge, it's a really uh, tender uh, enamel. So I'm going to make sure to write it on the sticker. As you can see here, when I took it out of the kiln, I pushed a little bit with my spatula to flatten it and it was still tender and it got a mark from it. So I think these uh, Milton Bridge colors are maybe designed for jewelry or being fired at a lower temperature. I have to be careful if I'm gonna mix them up with Soye or other brands that fire at a higher temperature that I'm not gonna have uh, problems there. So I add a sticker saying tender, that's Catalan for tender, and this way I will not forget that I have to be careful with this color. You can also see there is a little bit of kiln wash, uh, my kaolin that I use for that, and uh, it's really not a problem for a palette. If I will be making a jewelry piece, I will be firing it on a trivet or so, so I wouldn't get any marks. This yellow didn't seem to at first have a reaction when applied directly on the silver foil, but on the second fire it started to react. As you can see here, there's like an opacifying effect and a little bit of an orangey cast to it. And on the red, as I expected, we get an orange uh, effect on top of the silver foil. It is very, very rare. You can uh, come across a red that doesn't uh, have this happening. And the grays, I love grays. Uh, this one is really beautiful. It's a much cooler uh, gray than the 600 Swire. It's really nice. And uh, they actually have performed really well directly on the copper. As you can see, it's not perfect like a flux, but you can even see the engraving. That's really nice. Uh, I love to use uh, colors direct on the copper. It can be used for a bass tie or uh, other effects. And here on the opaque palettes, you can see that I have one or two layers. Here's one. And uh, if it's useful for you, if you use special effects and overfire often, uh, you can actually overfire your first layer. Here it happened by accident. Uh, reds are very delicate, but I don't really use special effects, so I normally don't bother to do this. But it can be really useful if you do use special effects. You can have one overfire layer, and then the second will show you the full uh, color strength. I find that these little palettes are really big enough for opaque. Uh, there is not a lot of information that you need on opaque colors. So we have now reached the end of the video. You can click on the link in the description box and subscribe to the mailing list. And you will also find links to my Facebook and Instagram, but the mailing list is the safest way to never miss a release. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful. And if you have any question, do not hesitate to comment here or in the Facebook page. See you soon. Bye.